Today, Pastor Javen continues our series entitled, Starts Here. And we will see that our most difficult circumstances may open the door for some of our greatest opportunities. So take a moment now, prepare your heart for today's service. We're going to read from 2 Corinthians. All praise to God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all our comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. I pray for this word to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the sick. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, God. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Miss Cindy. Amen. It is a good day, and we are glad, again, that you are here with us. And I do believe God has something for us today, so I pray your heart is open after that powerful time of worship to receive uh, from his, his word today together as we open up his word and, and glean from him. I, uh, I read recently about a, uh, some students at a medical school and a medical program in New York. Uh, these are students who are in a nursing program that are, uh, that are going in to be geriatric nurses. They're going to care for those who are elderly. And so they have an, a unique opportunity in this program for 10 days. They get to basically live uh, in a nursing home as if they were uh, those type patients. So they get to experience life from their standpoint. They get to experience what life is like in a wheelchair, going down the hallways and into rooms and into bathrooms with wheelchairs. They get to experience what it's like to, to get out of a bed that has a lift that's, take, that's helping them out of a bed. They get to experience taking a shower in a shower with handicap bars and seats and things of that nature to see what it's like. They learn the little intricate details that matter, like having nameplates low for those that are in those chairs that, so that they can see things at their eye level. They, they learn little details, just like putting the TV's remote control, uh, close to the bedside before they walk out of a room. So, it, or close to wherever the patient is sitting. So the patient isn't searching for it or looking for it. They learn these little things to help them be better at their job, right? And here's the thing they're doing. They're experiencing things that they wouldn't necessarily want to experience. Catch this so that they can help those that they otherwise would not be able to fully help. That's why they do it. We are in the middle of the series, uh, starts here, start here. And we, we've been looking at the opportunities that we have that are in front of us every day to be a part of the mission of God. You know, we, we said from the week one that, that missions, when we think of missions, we often think of going somewhere. And that is a part of missions. We are a part of that. We have a team going to Belize in October. You can go online. You can uh, find more information about that on our website. If you just go to the website and then scroll down to Central Hub, you'll find it. But, uh, but you can see about that. But missions work for God is simply the mission of God at work. And that's wherever you are. And it starts right where you are every day of your life. We said we have opportunities around us all the time. Opportunities that might come in the form of interruptions. <laughs> they often do. They might come in the form of inconveniences. And sometimes they are. But these interruptions, these inconveniences, these opportunities, they're opportunities to be what we say at the end of every service every week. They're opportunities for us to be catalysts for transformation in our community. So we, one, we, we talked about the fact that there is a better way for this world. There is a better way. The best way is Jesus Christ. It's to point people to Jesus Christ. And so we said, if we combine our faith with the empowering work of the Holy Spirit that wants to work through us, then, then, then we will begin in, to point people to Jesus the better way. And, and it, we can start right here. We can start right now by doing that. Last week, Pastor Caleb talked to us about how uh, we can start right now with the next generation. That that pointing people to the better way can start with those in your very home, those ones who are your children, those ones who might be your grandchildren, those nieces, those nephews, those cousins, those whatever they may be, anybody you may have connection to in the next generation. You can do it. If you don't have anyone in a family, you can do it by starting in the church. You can do it by starting in the community. But the next generation needs to know the better and the best way, and that's Jesus Christ. And we can start by 
right here where we are, where we live every day. This week, I want to take us uh, to a miracle of Jesus that's actually recorded in all four Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all four of them write about this particular miracle in this particular situation that takes place. And what we get out of this, what we're going to see out of this context of this passage today is that God does want to work for us. He wants to do things for us, but he doesn't just want to do things for us. He wants to work through us. Okay. And that's what we're trying to get across through this series. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14 today. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, But I want to set up where we are in in this context because it's important. The very first sentence that we're going to read is important for you to understand where we are. Jesus had a cousin. You probably know who he is. His cousin's name was John. You, you've heard of him called John the Baptist, likely. Uh, but that was his cousin. He was John the Baptist because he baptized people all the time. He was John the Baptizer. That was basically what people called him. Well, John, uh, there was a ruler in the region of Galilee, a Roman ruler. Rome would put their rulers in different places. There was a ruler in this region. Uh, his, he was Herod Antipas. All right. John had made some remarks about Herod that Herod didn't like very much. See, Herod was with a woman. This woman was his half brother's presumed ex-wife. So basically what John was saying is he's having, I mean, he's basically having an affair with a woman he doesn't need to be with. And he's proclaiming that all over the place. And so John, he doesn't hate, or Herod doesn't hate John enough to have him killed. So he puts him in prison to try to bring the noise down from John, right? Puts him in prison. Well, Matthew tells us that one night Herod's having a party, he's throwing a party. And this is a good party for Herod, apparently. Well, he's got a lady dancing for him there at, at his party. And this lady is the daughter of the woman that uh, Herod is with, his half-brother's presumably ex-wife. This is her daughter that's dancing for Herod. And Matthew tells us that Herod likes her dancing for him. Totally messed up situation. So Herod looks at her and he says, I tell you what, because I, I, you do such a great job dancing, I'm going to give you whatever you want, whatever you desire. And she says, I want John's head on a platter. Immediately regrets <laughs> saying whatever you want. So, but Herod's in a position where he can't pull his offer back. He's got to go through it. Because if he doesn't go through it, it's going to make him look weak to the people who are there. And once the word starts spreading that it happened, it's going to make him look weak. So he goes through with it. He has John killed in that way, brings the head on the platter to her. She takes the platter to her mom, the woman that Herod is with, and gives it to her. Don't know if they were working behind the scenes to get this done or not. Again, totally messed up situation. But we need to know the context of, context of that as we go into Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start at verse 13. All right. And this is what it says. As soon as Jesus heard the news, what news? What I just told you about. All right. So as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and they followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and they said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and they can buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up toward heaven. He blessed the five loaves and two fish. And then he broke the loaves into pieces. He gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and the children. That's a pretty incredible word, a pretty incredible thing that's happening in this situation in this point. Now, just like at Easter, we saw that Jesus had lost a friend, Lazarus. Lazarus died. And we see, if you remember, Jesus grieved over the loss of Lazarus. He grieved in that moment. He's doing the same thing here. He's grieving over the loss of John the Baptist. That's what Matthew tells us. As soon as he heard the news about what had happened, he went off to be by himself. He's grieving. Now, if this happens to Jesus, then you know, as a follower of Christ... That being a follower of Christ does not isolate you from pain, 
from grief, from misfortune. Things are going to happen in our life as followers of Christ that are not great. It happened to Jesus. He experienced it. But we face those things. When we face those things, we have those things happen to us. We face them with faith and we face them with perseverance. Where does that faith and where does that perseverance come from? It can only come to us in the same way it came to Jesus. And that's by spending time with the Father. That's what Jesus did. He got alone and he spent time with the Father. Listen, the most important parts of your life as a follower of Christ are the parts that only the Father sees. That's your time alone with him. That's some of the most important parts of your life. Because he needs to see you. He wants to see you spending time with him. He's your Father. your Heavenly Father. And he wants to see you spending time with him. It's just like the prophet Isaiah said, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. But we've got to be in the presence of God. We've got to be waiting. We've got to be seeking him. Now, Mark tells us, when you look at Mark's account of this gospel, Mark tells us that the disciples, they had been out doing ministry. Jesus had sent the disciples out two by two, going out around the area, going and ministering to people and uh, telling them the things that Jesus had done, doing the things that Jesus had been doing. So they've been doing ministry. And Mark tells us that they're just coming back. So we can imagine that the disciples are coming back from doing all that ministry exhausted. They're coming back tired. And they're coming back to the news that John had been killed. And so Mark tells us that he looks at his disciples and he says, guys, let's go off together. Let's go off together. Now, I want to mention that this doesn't contradict Matthew's account, okay? Because you can look at other accounts throughout the Gospels. You can look at other places where Jesus and the disciples did this often. They would go off together, isolated from the crowds, but then Jesus would go off a little bit further on his own, okay? That's not unusual. This happened all the time. So when you put the combination together, the Gospels and the writings, you, you can put together that they went off to spend some time together, but then Jesus went out on the boat to be alone to spend time with just his father. Okay, but they're spending time and they're seeking God. Now, this is a lesson for us too in our moments when we're facing these moments of pain, of grief, of misfortune. You need the people who are closest to you, who are also close to the Father, you need them near you. But you also need times with just you and the Father. You need both. You need them all. Okay, and so this is what's happening in this situation at this point. But I also want us to see this. Because this is what's happening in this context and in this, in this time frame. Even in the face of disappointment, even in the face of tragedy, even in the face of exhaustion, God's call still exists in their life and in our life to allow him to work through us. Even in our pain, even in our discomfort, even in all of those tragic moments, God's call to allow him to work through us still exists. And that can be difficult. It would have been very tempting for Jesus when he stepped off that boat and then all of a sudden he saw all these crowds of people that had followed them to where they are. It would have been very tempting to him to look at the disciples and say, hey guys, let's get in the boat. Let's all go off. Because the boat's big enough. We see that. If you keep reading Matthew, you see that. They could have gotten in the boat and they could have left. It could have been very tempting for Jesus to do that. It would have been very tempting for Jesus to look at the crowd and say, guys, guys, not today. Y'all have got to go home. Maybe another day. We'll do this another day. Because we're going to see in a moment, Jesus does disperse the crowd. He doesn't do that though. In this moment, in one of his, in, in, a, in a painful moment when he's grieving the loss of his cousin, he gets out of the boat, he sees the crowd, and Matthew tells us that he has compassion on the people. In a moment of disappointment in his life, it becomes a God appointment. And that's the same for us. And some of our biggest disappointments in life, those biggest disappointments in our life become God appointments for him to work through us in life. It sounds crazy, but he can do that. See, in the middle of his pain, Jesus has compassion for the people. And we I've mentioned this before, that that word compassion, it is a word that, that means it's a visceral feeling in your gut. That when, when, you, when he saw these people, he was moved. And what happens is that move that happens in him is it makes you act in a way that's contrary to your natural self tendencies or your natural tendency to focus on yourself. I mean, that is, that's natural. We can't, we, we don't deny that. 
When we go through things in our life, the natural thing for us to do is withdraw, to pull away, and to focus just on us in the moment. That is natural. There's no condemnation if, that, if that's what you do. I've had moments like that when I've lost my father and, I've, and other things in, in this life have happened. I pull away. Natural tendency. But Jesus had this compassion within him that moved him despite that natural tendency. And that's what this compassion is. And that's the compassion that, that Jesus wants for us, wants, wants us to have in our life. Every right to spend time just with him, just with his disciples. But he was moved with compassion to have sympathy for these people. His pain over John, his cousin John, his pain over John was the loss, the physical loss of his cousin. The pain when he looked out and he saw these people, the pain he was feeling in that moment was the lostness of their souls. He knew they were lost. Their, their souls were not saved. And he hurt because of that. The lostness that he felt, the, the, the pain he felt personally over John, that pain was the loss that he wouldn't have John to continue his time on this earth being present with. His ministry started with his cousin, baptizing him. And now he's lost his cousin. He won't be able to see him again. He won't be able to send communication with him. He won't be able to share stories with him anymore. So Jesus, he's, he's I imagine, hurting because he loses his brother physic, or his cousin physically on this earth. But he knew he'd see him again in, in eternity. The loss that he has for these, or the, the pain that he has for these people is because of the lostness that if they were to die in that day, he wouldn't see him on the other side of eternity. They would be eternally lost. This was the compassion he was moved with. Eight out of the 12 times that this word is used in the New Testament to reference this type of compassion and this type of move, is, it references Jesus Christ. It's in reference to Jesus. Eight out of the 12 times. What should that tell us? Well, if we are followers of Christ and our desire is to become more like Christ, then we should have this desire to say, God, give me that same compassion. That when I see the way you see, I'm moved the way you're moved. Maybe you remember the 3D art craze from years ago. They were called stereograms or auto stereograms. I brought an image of one. You can look at it. You remember these things? It just looks like a jumble mess, right? If you see that picture and you're looking at it and you're like, what? And someone tells you there's something inside that. There is art inside that. You're like, no way. And I remember when these things come out, I would stare at these pictures going cross-eyed. And I kind of remember when the first time I saw it like jump out to me, I was like, oh my goodness, there it is. I saw it. And then it went away. Just like, just as quickly as I saw it, it went away. And then you're like staring at it again, trying to find the thing, right? But there is something in this. And the next slide is the video of it. Watch. And you see it? It's a shark swimming right there. It's right there in the middle. But that art is, is in there. But you've just got to adjust your eyes to find what's inside what you're initially seeing. Can you imagine if we could begin to see the world the way Jesus sees the world? We have a visual that's in front of us. We see things the way we see them. But if we could just see what's inside of that the way Jesus sees it. What Jesus is trying to point out to us, that happens the more we spend time with the Father through Jesus Christ. The more we spend time with the Father through Jesus Christ, the more we're moved to see the world the way he sees it. The more we're moved with compassion. The more we're moved to allow Jesus to work through us. Now, when we look at Matthew's account that we read, Matthew tells us that he began to heal the people that were there. So Jesus began to meet the physical needs of the people. Matthew points that out. Mark and Luke, when you look at Mark and Luke's gospel, they tell us that before he began to heal people, that he taught them. He spent time teaching them. He taught them about the kingdom of God and the principles of the kingdom of God. And then he began to meet their physical needs. He began to heal them. And then he performed the incredible miracle that took place. The, The needs of the physical are important. Meeting physical needs are important, but the needs of the soul are of first importance. That's why Jesus taught them first. Listen, causes are great. Causes are wonderful. We, we should work and help with causes. 
Our church does that. We work and we help with causes. In fact, I encourage you to be here next week to hear more about that, how uh, you can be a part of starting here, helping and reaching our community. But causes are just an avenue to meet the need that's of first importance. The cause can never be greater than the call. And the call is, the, is, is to show others Jesus Christ, to point to Christ. We're not going to stop feeding people. <laughs> We're going to feed people. We're going to do things like that. But the greatest call is to point them to the better way. The call has to be the greatest thing. So Jesus teaches them. He ministers to their soul. He ministers to their physical needs by healing them. And then he does this incredible miracle. And he does it through the disciples. Now I want us to pause and notice that the disciples, the first thing they did, once they realized it's getting late, everybody's getting hungry, we need to send them away so that they can go get food. The first thing the disciples wanted to do was send the people away. Right? Now, we can't be very hard on the disciples. We shouldn't be very hard on the disciples because they're thinking logically. They're thinking, they're looking at the situation logically and they're thinking about things through that way. If you remember the whole context of everything too, they're probably very exhausted. They've been out traveling ministry. They come back, they get a little bit of time, but then immediately they're, they're sworn by crowds again. They're probably exhausted and they're thinking, we want to go home and get something to eat and get some sleep. Can't fault them for that. We've all been in that same boat. So their response is, let's just send the need that's in front of us away. They'll find a way or or there'll be another way. We've all been in that situation. And I don't want to condemn anyone. I've been in that situation where my response has been, somebody else will meet that. But I have to look back and question, where was my heart in that encounter? You know, there was a, maybe you've heard of D.L. Moody. He had built Sunday schools all throughout Chicago and in that area. And people would come from all over, kids especially, would come from all over to, to go and experience these Sunday schools and these environments and these men, the ministry that D.L. Moody was doing. They would pass by other churches that were doing the same thing. <clears throat> and so news reporters were fascinated by this. So they sent some people out there. They were watching what was going on. And one reporter uh, saw a child and he heard the child talking about how far he had walked to get there. So the reporter asked the child, he said, why do you pass all those places? Why do you come to this place to come to this Sunday school? And the child's response was, because they love a fellow over here. People know when you're showing them love. And people know when you're just trying to send them away. Think about it. You know. (laughs) You know. When someone's truly showing love to you or when they're just trying to get out of the situation. You know. We have to watch our heart. We have to watch our, our, our how we are in that situation. And so I don't know what the disciples, I'm just reading the scripture. So let's just, let's look and let's think about it for our own perspective. Think about our hearts. And then let's look at the rest of the passage and look at what Jesus encourages them and Jesus shows them to do. Jesus looks at them, Matthew says, and he tells them, you give them something to eat. Now, people who are really smart in Greek that I read and, and look at, they tell us the emphasis in that writing on that, on that language is on the you. The emphasis is on the you because they're putting the importance on the fact that they need to be the ones that take some type of step to do something. And then the word give in the Greek in the writing, it's in the imperative form, which means that when Jesus said that, Matthew is pointing out the way he wrote it, that he meant do it right now, don't delay. Don't waste any time. Now, what's interesting is when Matthew wrote, send them away, when disciples said, send them away, he wrote that in the same type of form, which meant the disciples were saying, send them home now. Don't delay. Don't waste time. Let's get them away. And Jesus turns them on it and turns it on them and says, no, you do something right now. You do something right now. But I think this might be the problem that the disciples, when you look at the context of the passage and you look at all four gospels, I think the problem that was happening, and this is the problem that happens in our life, they were letting their focus on their insufficiencies affect their faith rather than focusing on God's sufficiency and letting that affect their faith. There's a difference. 
Because, see, they, they, they keep talking about how they don't have anything to feed all of these people. It's 5,000 men, Matthew tells us, in addition to women and children. Most scholars tell you there's anywhere from ten to 15,000 people probably on that in that area. That's a lot of people. And all they've got, according to Matthew, is five loaves of bread and two fish. But John's gospel, John tells us that Jesus looks at Philip. This is interesting to me, so I looked into this one. Jesus looks at Philip and he says, Philip, where can we go to get food? Because that area was Philip's hometown. Philip was the disciple that lived closest to this area. And John tells us this, this, this was a test for Philip. It's almost like Jesus is looking at him and saying, John, uh, Philip, do you know how to meet the needs of the people in your hometown where you live? Do you know how to start right where you are? But John, I'm, but Philip, John tells us Philip just immediately begins to think about what he doesn't have. We don't have the money, even if there's a store open right now. I mean, there's Dollar Generals on every corner. But even if, even if we don't have the money to go and get the food that we need. Again, that's logical thinking, right? And we get into situations like this a lot of times in our life and we'll see a need in front of us and we might be moved by that need, but we're thinking there's nothing I can do for that need because all we're doing is we're looking at what we don't have to meet that need. When God moves us into situations like this and similar to this, rather than immediately writing off and saying, I have nothing to give and I can't do it. Rather than that immediately being your first reaction, just sit and begin to ponder and spend some time with God and say, God, what do you want to do? Because it's in those moments that God may do something amazing through you. It's in those moments that you may actually begin to see and realize and learn that what God has called you to, he'll enable you for. So don't look at what you don't have. Look at what you do have. That's what Jesus is getting the disciples to do. And he's asking them, what do we have? Tell me what you have. And so John tells us, Matthew tells us they got five loaves of bread and two fish. John's gospel tells us that Andrew got that because a child walked up and gave him that bread and fish. And the the faith of a child said, I can give you this. And so Andrew was looking at the other guys. We we got this. We give him this. And I said, Jesus, all we got is this. And he says, bring it to me, Jesus said. Don't go to Jesus with what you don't have. Take him what you do have and then watch him do more with what you have than you can do on your own. But we've got to be willing to give him what we have. So the disciples did that and then Jesus worked through it. Now this is When you read John's gospel, if you go on in John's gospel... John goes next into the section where Jesus begins to talk about himself being the bread of life. And when you put those passages together of the disciples giving them the bread they do have and then Jesus dividing it up, it's almost like John is putting those things together and saying, Jesus is the bread of life. When you get that bread from him, when he gives it to you, you give it to others and let it multiply. Share the bread of life. It's our call. It's what we're called to do. It's God's call for us. And there's no better place to start than where you are every day of your life. I'm not saying you got to walk around with a Bible and a pulpit in front of you, carrying it around, preaching. No. But you share the love of God in every context and every opportunity that you have through Jesus Christ. You give it to them. Now, if you keep going in Matthew's gospel, you see that Jesus puts the disciples on a boat. And again, the Greek, the, they tell us that that word and how he puts them in the boat is a very forceful terminology. He makes them get on the boat. Why? Well, when you look in John's gospel, John's got, John writes and tells us that the people in that area in the community, they wanted to make Jesus king in that moment because of the miracle he had just done. 
If he can feed 15,000 people with five pieces of bread and two fish, what else can he do, right? That's what they're thinking. So they want to start a political revolution. And we know that the disciples would buy into this. We know that they would be all for this because you've, we, we, we see in other places in the scripture where John and James go to Jesus and we're like, hey, uh, can, can we get those two thrones, those smaller thrones that sit right beside your big throne? Can we get those when you take reign over the kingdom? Because all they're thinking is we're going we're gonna to take reign. We're going to push the leaders out. We're going to take over. Jesus is going to be king. We're going to rule with him. That's, that's their thinking. So Jesus knew they would buy into this revolution, but it wasn't about earthly popularity for Jesus. It was about eternal impact. And that's what our ministry should be. It shouldn't be about people know who we are and what we can do and all these great things. It should be about eternal impact. That's what it's all about. So Jesus gets the disciples on a boat and then he turns around to the people and then he sends them away. He pushes the distraction away. He sends the distraction away. And then what does he do? Matthew tells us he goes back. The gospels tell us he goes back and he spends more time with his father. He goes back to spend more time with his father. Important. Spending time with the father. You've got to know when to push the distractions aside. A.W. Tozer, he made this comment. He said, modern civilization is so complex as to make the devotional life all but impossible. He says it wears us out by multiplying distractions and beats us down by destroying our solitude where otherwise we might drink and renew our strength before going out to face the world again. So he says modern distractions, modern civilization, it can be a distraction. What was modern civilization for A.W. Tozer? He is not a modern writer. He is no longer with us. What was modern civilization for A.W. Tozer? He says commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. That is wise counsel and it's healing counsel. But how can it be followed in this day of the newspaper, the telephone, the radio, and the television? These modern playthings like pet tiger cubs have grown so large and dangerous that they threaten to devour us all. What was intended to be a blessing has become a positive curse. No spot is now safe from the world's intrusion. And that was talking about newspapers, radio, and television. What would he say today? You know what he would say. Because you know the distractions. Like most of you, they're in your pocket, right where mine is. Right? It's distraction. But we've got to be like Christ to know when we need to push the distraction away. Disperse the the distraction. Push it aside. Because all that distraction is going to do is going to take us off our actual focus. Jesus knew it was going to take those disciples off off the focus where it needed to be. And he wasn't going to let it do it to them. He wasn't going to let it do it to him. He pushed the distraction aside and he went and he spent time with the Father. Jesus knew what it was like to be surrounded by distractions, but he knew how to spend time with the father and he knew what it was like to be surrounded by needs. He knew what it was like to experience pain, to experience grief, to experience disappointment. But because he spent time with the father, even in those moments, he was able to have compassion to help others in their need. The only way he could do it was because he spent time with the father. It's the only way. You go back to our opening text that Miss Cindy read for us this morning. These were the words of Paul to the church of Corinth. And what did he tell him in the second letter he wrote to him? What did he tell him? He said, our father, <laughs> he gives us everything we need. He is the God of all comfort. And he comforts us so that we can comfort others. He works in your need so that he can use you to in that same need help and work with others. He strengthens you in that moment so that you can carry strength to others in theirs. That word that he, 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 does, he comforts you, he, it's, the, it's a Greek word that's it's from two Greek words. It means to call out from. God is calling out strength in you through his Holy Spirit so that he can use you to strengthen others. There's another, one other interesting thing that happens at the end of Matthew's gospel, right after this, when the disciples are sent off on the boat, Jesus disperses the crowd. 
things. One other interesting thing, Jesus is sending them out. Well, all of a sudden, he's spending time with the Father. All of a sudden, a storm comes up. You've likely heard the story, read the story at some point. Storm comes up. They're out there on the boat. Water on the lake is going crazy. <clears throat> they're getting nervous. So they're crying out. Jesus realizes that they're in trouble. So he goes to them. Mind you, they're in a boat on the water. The boat Jesus had been in. Jesus didn't have a boat. They were on his boat. But he goes to them. Walking. On water. Right? Now, the the people who are with him, the disciples, they tell us about this encounter. And so he walks out to them. And just like it would do you, (laughs) it freaks them out. Because they think they're seeing a ghost. Imagine the 24 hours that they have just experienced. Right? I mean, I've told you, these guys are tired. They've come back from doing all this ministry. They've only gotten a small break. And now they're doing ministry again with the crowds with Jesus. They're tired. So they're probably thinking, we're hallucinating. We're so tired. We're hallucinating in the middle of the storm. And then they realize, because Jesus speaks to them. And they're like, wait, 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 wait. That's Jesus. He's walking on water. And so Peter, the ambitious one, calls out, Jesus, if that's you, call to me. Tell me to come to you. And so he does. And Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to, begins to walk on the water. Amazing. But his focus gets on the waves and on everything happening around him that he begins to fall in. Jesus catches him. Matthew tells us, he grabs his arm, he's pulling him up, and he says, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? It's almost like Jesus was asking him, he's saying, why? Why did you let the circumstances that are happening around you cause you to doubt the incredible work of faith that was happening in you and through you in this moment? Why? Why? Jesus was constantly trying to teach his disciples, trying to get them to understand, I don't want to just work for you. I want to work through you. These 12 guys out on a boat after so many incredible things, they had just witnessed Jesus feed thousands. Now they're watching him walk on water. And in the middle of a storm, they're wondering what's going to happen. 11 of them frightened by the circumstances around them. And one has the boldness to say, hey, let me do something. Call call me to action, Jesus. And Jesus calls him to action. And at least he takes a step. Listen, if you wait until you're sure you'll never sink, you'll never take a step. And even if you do take the step and the circumstances around you get crazy and you feel like you're dropping, as long as you call out to him, you'll never drown. He's right there. He wants to work through you. And he wants to still work through you too, even in your greatest moments of pain. Even through disappointments. Those disappointments can become God appointments for your life. Maybe not right then, but somewhere down the road, God may want to use you in them. God may want to work through you in them. The whole thing, this whole, when, what Jesus did through the multitude, feeding the multitude with his disciples, what Jesus did in that, with, with Peter in that moment on the water, the whole thing was Jesus trying to get them to understand, I don't just want to work for you, I want to work through you. No matter what's happening in your life and around your life, I want to work through you. That's the call on your life as a follower of Christ. And in both of these situations, there's two qualities that we see that are necessary. There's availability and there's obedience. How available are you to God working through you? And how obedient are you when the opportunity is there for you to work? How available? How obedient? And sometimes, like in this situation with Jesus and his disciples, your greatest moments of pain, your greatest moments of discomfort can be your greatest moments of ministry and your greatest acts of faith because Jesus can work through that he will comfort you to comfort others but you've got to spend time with the father because the more you spend time with the father 
the more it prepares you for those moments and the more it prepares you for God to work through you in those moments, to strengthen you, to call out strength from others. And there's no better place to start than where you are every day of your life. Stand with me this morning. shared this morning, one of our team members that serves with our worship team, Jana, some of you know her, she's the tall one. She unfortunately lost her father this past week. So she's one of those that I was talking about this morning when praying. But in her moment of losing her father, they had a very small service at Fort Jackson for him. And she felt the only thing that she could do for her dad was to sing Amazing Grace in that moment. And so she did. And in one of her greatest moments of pain, one of her greatest moments of discomfort in her life and grief, she sings that song. And afterwards, one of the gentlemen from the cemetery at Fort Jackson walks up to her and says, would you be willing? I am always looking for someone to come and sing for families. Would you be willing to do what you just did today if the opportunity arose to sing for other families like that? In her greatest moment of pain, her greatest moment of grief, the loss of her father, a huge disappointment in her life, became a God appointment for her life. And now she will have moments and opportunities where she can go and she can stand at a graveside with people and use what she has, her voice. What she doesn't have is relationship with those people. What she doesn't have is any form of connection. But what she has is her voice. And she has a gift. And she'll have the opportunity to use her gift to express through the anointing of the Holy Spirit on that gift the amazing grace of Jesus Christ. How sweet the sound. Just give him what you have. That's all he wants. Even in your greatest disappointments. Because those disappointments can become God appointments. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your spirit and your presence. And I pray today for anyone in this room or who may watch online that does not have a relationship with you as their father. God, you can change that. And all it takes is their willingness to say, I want that. If you're here today, if you're watching today, in your own words, all you have to do is express your desire to be in relationship with the father. That you believe Jesus Christ gave his life. That you accept the forgiveness of your sins that he's offered you. And that you want to walk away from the life you're in now to a new life with him. You just express those things in your words from your heart. And you begin a relationship with the father. So I just encourage you today, if that's you, to do that. Experience the amazing grace. Jesus Christ today. Father, I pray for those as well that maybe they are right now in a moment of pain, of grief, of discomfort, of misfortune in their life. God, they're struggling to see how they're going to get through their need. God, I pray that you do comfort them, you strengthen them, you help them through their need by your grace, by your mercy. But God, I pray that you will do it in a way that that they would see your work and that they will be used by you to to help do that for others. That they will see that you, you don't want to just work for them in that situation. You want to work through them. God, I pray that if you have an appointment for them, in their disappointment, that they will see that, God. I thank you for it today, Father. We love you, God. 
If you need prayer in any way today, we would love for you to reach out to us. You can go to our website, bwccamden.com, go to our contact page. You'll find a link there to uh, request prayer or send us anything that you uh, would like to communicate with us today. Or you can also simply text the word prayer to 803-676-7566. And we will be back in touch with you to find out how we can be in prayer for you. God bless you. We hope that you have a great week.